Okay, hi, a oh, very good evening, uh, each and every one of you. So how are you guys doing? Uh, so I, I hope it is streaming fine. Yeah, you closed your eyes and you hope, so here I am. Anyways, so a very good evening, each and every one of you. Please confirm the audio and video streaming. We'll proceed with our discussion today. And before that, uh, I want you to uh, allow me at least two to three minutes, okay? I need to make some adjustments and then I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Right? And also we have very interesting things to discuss today. I'll be uh, letting you know that particular information, general information, which is relevant to each and every one of us. And also it's linked to current pandemic, okay? So please allow me two to three minutes of time. I'll get back to you as soon as possible, right? Since you started the time, uh, I just started live. I'll get back to you within two to three minutes, okay? And, and of course, yes, today's questions are going to be very challenging. Let's see how many of you are going to answer them right. Okay, right, so I'm back online. So really appreciate uh, for waiting. So as I said, uh, I was out of town. I just returned back home and uh, I just came a couple of hours before. And anyways, let's proceed with our quick revision class as usual. And as I said, we have a lot, lot to discuss in this particular session. And I'll be starting with some general topics and then we'll proceed to our presentation where we'll be discussing prosthodontics, few select topics from prosthodontics. I hope you guys are all ready, right? So first and foremost, as, as you said, everything seems to be fine. Yeah, thank you. So the first thing which I wanted to discuss is a general thing, which I'm sure is relevant to each and every one of us. I'll come across a news stating that there is a new disease or a new phenomenon called Zoom dysmorphia. In fact, we are Zooming right now and it's being streamed to uh, YouTube simultaneously. Uh, so scientists are coming across a new phenomenon called Zoom dysmorphia. So what is this all about? The increase, you know, in fact, scientists have found that there is a recent surge in number of uh, requirements or demand for plastic surgery cases because of Zoom because Zoom presents you the unedited picture of yourself. The increase in the number of Zoom meetings due to COVID-19 could be behind the surge in demand for plastic surgery, experts said in an editorial published in Facial Plastic Surgery and Aesthetic Medicine. Unlike the still filtered selfies of social media, Zoom displays an unedited version of oneself, uh, they said and they're calling the new phenomena Zoom dysmorphia. Isn't this unfortunate? You're not able to see, uh, we're not able to see ourselves in an unedited version and we are used to this selfie uh, filters and all editing uh, aspect. And this is very, very unfortunate. And I found it really funny because you're not able to uh, accept yourself un in unedited version. So where are we progressing in this direction? So this is something which I want each and every one of you to think over. In fact, uh, even when I started Zooming, uh, the picture is not so clear, unlike uh, YouTube live or other live or recorded videos, but still I'm lucky that I could accept myself and I, I never felt that I need a plastic surgery, but there are several people who feel otherwise, which is very unfortunate. So I think this is something which we should all think over, which is important reality or a matrix kind of situation. So again, that's our choice. Zoom dysmorphia, I've come across this term Zoom dysmorphia. I wanted to share the same with you, okay? And the second news which I've come across is something which is very relevant to us, periodontics. So in fact, there was a news in Al Jazeera stating that just a couple of hours ago, stating that a mouthwash was developed which can kill COVID-19 in 30 seconds, according to an in vitro study, it has to be peer reviewed, still clinical trials have to be done. And the results will be mostly published in early 2021, according to researchers, according to periodontists. But this is a one breaking news which I've come across. So Cardiff University study finds mouthwash containing 0.07% cetypyridinium chloride, which can combat coronavirus within 30 seconds. So in fact, scientists say, along with social distancing, using mouth mask, and along with hand sanitizing, using this mouthwash will also add in our combined fight against this current pandemic, right? So this is some news which I wanted to highlight, right? I hope, I hope this is interesting. And now let's move on to our 
regular session as usual. So how are you guys doing? So how has been your day so far? Yeah, beauty is in mind. Of course, beauty is in mind. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I'm glad we have students joining from other planets as well. I really appreciate your enthusiasm. So welcome to all humans and aliens. Okay, yes. I think some of you are discussing multiple choice questions. <laughs> That's up to you. It's like backbenchers doing, in fact, in an offline classroom, we often find backbenchers doing other nonsensical things. But I'm really glad that in this online classroom, I see backbenchers discussing subject. So this is definitely an astonishing and surprising finding. Yes, and also we have students joining from Pakistan and Egypt. That's wonderful to hear. Okay, so let's start our presentation. So first and foremost, as you can see, this is again, one of my favorite places. Personally, uh, I love this place so much. In fact, we stayed there for literally around 15 to 20 days. It was amazing. Uh, a place called Kemti in Uttarakhand. Uttarakhand, you have several hill stations and it's an amazing state. We've been to Dehradun and from Dehradun, uh, we drove to Kemti. It was a scenic drive and it was amazing. And as you can see, it's all greenery, no snowfall, uh, maybe in December or Jan, according to some locals, but it's mostly green, very uh, cool and amazing skies. So in fact, this place Kemti, if you are interested, it's around 13 kilometers from Musauri. You know Musauri, right? Yeah, we also have an IS training academy there. And it's around 45 kilometers from Dehradun. So some geography for you, for those enthusiasts who are willing to travel and explore different places in different parts of the world. So this is one of my favorite places. Musauri, I found it very busy, hustling. It's a wonderful place, no doubt. But I found Kemti, which is closer by Musauri, even more interesting and amazing. Right, so let's start our presentation with the following question. So in fact, I've asked yesterday, uh, one of you uh, uh, asked me like, what are interpolation flaps when we discussed about the same, when we discussed about uh, nasolabial flaps, melolabial flap. So what are interpolation flaps and what do you mean by them? Uh, where do you use them? What exactly does it mean? So if anyone of you have any idea, you can answer. Yes, you can of course answer this question. If you have no idea, that's fantastic. We'll review some literature and we'll try to explore this particular information. So interpolation, when you look into dictionary, the general meaning of interpolation is insertion of something of a different nature into something else. So you're taking something from one place and then trying to place it at a different place, something of that sort. So that's interpolation is by meaning. So what is this interpolation flag? So an interpolation flap is a two-stage tissue flap in which the base of the flap is not immediately adjacent to the recipient site and contains its own inherent blood supply. As you can see in this particular illustration, uh, we need flap somewhere on nose and you're trying to obtain donor tissue from elsewhere, from a different site, but not from the adjacent uh, site of the recipient area. So what is this interpolation flap? So interpolation flap is a two-stage tissue flap in which the base of the flap is not immediately adjacent to the recipient site and contains its own inherent blood supply. And why do we need this interpolation flap? So interpolation flaps provide excellent method of reconstructing large or deep defects where adjacent local tissue cannot supply sufficient donor tissue for repair. So it's in tissue is not suffice for covering up this patch or defect. So we're trying to obtain flap elsewhere. So interpolation flap. And how do you perform this? Uh, how do you actually use it clinically? So it's typically performed in two stages. The first stage consists of transposing donor tissue with vascular pedicle to the defect, as you can see in this illustration. While the second stage involves division of the vascular pedicle from the donor site. And where do you use them? In the head and neck region, as evident in this illustration, interpolation flaps are most commonly used for reconstruction of facial soft tissue defects, especially 
in nose and perinasal areas. So I've asked you one question yesterday, like where do you find or is nasolabial flap used as interpolation flap? So obviously the answer is yes, it can be used. Okay, and this is the meaning and some literature related to interpolation flap. I hope it's clear. Right? Now let's move on to our next aspect that is case-based question from yesterday's quick revision class. So a patient who has a past medical history significant for chronic renal failure is put on a regular diet. The next day, the patient develops flaccid muscles and decreased urinary output. His magnesium is normal. Yes, which electrolyte is most likely cause? So we have the following options, calcium, sodium, potassium, and iodine. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Yes, nasolabial or melolabial flap can be used as interpolation flap. Very good. So what do you think is the answer for this particular case-based question and why? See, in, in case of chronic renal failure or in cases where patients are chronic kidney disease, CKD, there is usually imbalance in electrolytes and acid-base balance, especially magnesium and potassium, their levels are affected. Uh, even in, uh, in case of my mother, her uh, magnesium levels have spiked up, her uh, phosphorus levels have increased enormously, her uh, potassium levels have also spiked up. So because of which there can be certain symptoms. So we'll review some literature, hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia is characterized by flaccid muscle, fatigue and ECG abnormalities in severe cases. Considering the patient's history of chronic renal failure in this particular context, he might have either hypermagnesemia or hyperkalemia. But magnesium is reported as normal as mentioned in the equation. Therefore, the potassium level must be checked and treated accordingly, right? So dietary restriction is main mode of treatment. That's what my mother is undergoing currently. So option C, yes, option C, potassium is the right answer. Just remember this, hyperkalemia and hypermagnesemia in chronic kidney patients in cases of chronic renal failure. I hope it's clear. Option C, I think some of you have chose option C yesterday. Yeah. So do review this information and if you need any further assistance or clarification, you can always get back to mail 24 by seven, right? So spasticity, uh, flaccidity, so try to get clarity regarding these terms, okay? Flaccid, spastic, flaccid, spastic. Now let's move on to our session proper. That is fake revision class prosthodontics, our ninth live session. So we'll start with that first question. I hope you guys are all ready. Intaglio surface is, so you have the following options. Option A, the portion of a surface of a denture ex extends in an occlusal direction from the border of denture and includes the palatal surfaces. Option B, that portion of denture surface which has its contour determined by impression. Option C, that portion of surface of denture or dentition which makes contact or near contact with corresponding surface of opposing dentition or denture. Option D, that part of a denture which rests on oral mucosa and to which teeth are attached. So, which option do you think is more appropriate answer? So, denture base is, I will, I will go through some definitions, GPD definitions. The moment I say definition, I know most of us have very negative feelings about the same because as students, we're all forced to memorize them and <laughs> repeat the same, unfortunately, as it is during viva and during routine, clinical viva, not just in final viva. Anyways, let's keep all that negativity aside and try to understand the concept or try to understand the meaning that suffice in entrance perspective, isn't it? So a denture base is, it's defined as that part of denture which rests on oral mucosa and to which teeth are attached. Sounds self-explanatory. Occlusal surface, that portion of a denture, uh, these are GBT definitions which I'm going through now. That portion of surface of denture or dentition which makes contact or near contact with corresponding surface of opposing denture or dentition. That's occlusal surface. Whereas polished or cameo surface, it is defined as that portion of a surface of denture with extends in an occlusal direction from the border of denture and includes palatal surfaces. It is part of denture base which is usually polished 
and it includes the buccal and lingual surfaces of teeth. We love this surface because we, we have an opportunity to polish it, right? So impression surface or intaglio surface, as per the definition, that portion of denture base which has its contour determined by you, that is by the way in which you take up the impression. You know, the funny thing is, uh, during our posting uh, in, in second year, we were very obvious, we were all very enthusiastic in the process of preparing an ideal denture. Out of four enthusiasm, we even polished the tissue surface and we showed to our professor with pride that we had done exceptional work by polishing it. He has taken our dentures, mine and my friend's dentures, and has simply put them in dustbin, saying that you have to repeat this because you have polished the tissue surface or the impression surface or intaglio surface. So as most of you mentioned, option B is right answer. So intaglio surface or impression surface, as the name itself indicates, that portion of denture base which has its contour determined by impression, right? So very good. So option B is right answer. And before we proceed any further, I want you guys to uh, score uh, your performance, right? Uh, so for each right response, starting from this question, plus four, and wrong response or wrong answer, minus one. And at the end of the session, when I ask you to present your marks, you can present it. So that will have some sense of competitiveness, healthy competition, okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now you can see some images, illustrations. So you can see on left side of the screen, the impression surface or intaglio surface. And on the right side, you can see polished or cameo surface. How wonderful the polishing is once you achieve it. Good, excellent. Now let's move on to our next question. Maxillary buccal frenum has attachments of following muscles, except. So which one do you think is exception among the given options? Orbicularis oris, buccinated, levator angular oris, and mesitus. So which option do you think is more appropriate answer? So obviously buccal frenum is a structure, an anatomical structure which separates labial and buccal vestibule. It has attachments of the following muscles. And I'll reveal the muscles after you answer. So these muscles influence the position of buccal frenum, hence it needs greater clearance on buccal flange of the denture. So clinically relevant point, try answering this question. In the meantime, let's review this information in the form of images. As you can see, top left, a clinical picture, edentulous. And this is mandibular buccal frenum. So just for the sake of understanding what a frenum is, you can see an elevation in mucosa. A buccal frenum, labial sulcus, and buccal sulcus. And on bottom right, you can see the maxillary buccal frenum with its muscle attachments. So there you go. You have some options over there. So orbicularis oris, buccinator, and levator angular oris. Option D is right answer, as all of you, or most of you rightly answer. So levator angular oris attaches beneath the frenum. Orbicularis oris pulls the frenum in forward direction. Orbicularis oris is here. So your buccal frenum is here. So it pulls on action, it pulls the frenum in forward direction. Buccinator is here, so it pulls the frenum in backward direction, right? And an important clinical note, which I'm introducing from this session with an apple sign. I love apple. I'm talking about fruit. So clinical note, the buccal frenum is attached to active muscle fibers, hence additional relief should be provided in buccal flange. So this is very, very important clinically. I'm sure you might have experienced during your clinical hours as well. So you can get an assertion and reason type of question. So additional relief should be provided in buccal flange is the assertion. Reason, because buccal frenum is attached to active muscle fibers. Consider this very, very important. Okay, yeah, option D is the right answer. Now let's move on to our next question. So uh, that quality or state because of surface tension causes elevation or depression of surface of a liquid that is in contact with a solid is called cohesion, interfacial surface tension, atmospheric pressure, capillary action. I mean, you might have observed this. Uh, you know, have you ever placed a sponge or a sponge in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a water bath? If you notice, it will uh, silently or calmly absorb all the water through all those porosities uh, against gravity, even against gravity, which is very much possible. So what does this explain? I, I, 
<laughs> okay, I don't know what Ankur is saying. Okay, yes, I'm great, just like you all. Yeah, so which option do you think is more appropriate answer? Before you answer, uh, I, I want you to go through this particular illustration. So what do you understand based on this? You can see two glass jars, one glass jar containing a colored solution and you placed some solid, it, it appears to be like a gauze or tissue paper, whatever it is, you can see it's getting soaked and then we can see actual transfer of fluid from one beaker, from one glass jar to the other. So what does this explain? Of course, as you said, several factors do play a role. Surface tension of liquid, coercive forces within the liquid, adhesive forces between the liquid and solid interface. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer after going through that particular illustration? I think we should incorporate this format in NEAT final exam also. For every question, a related explanatory uh, mode of uh, illustration for you to answer any question with is. Yes, option D, capillary action is a right answer. So that quality or state because of surface tension causes elevation or depression of surface of fluid that is in contact with the solid. So there are various factors which affect the retention of the processes, which include adhesion, cohesion, interfacial surface tension, capillary action, atmospheric pressure, and peripheral seal. So as, as most of you rightly answered, option D is a right answer. And you might wonder why this capillary action, what's actually influencing this capillary action. And if you carefully observe, you can see actual movement of fluid from one beaker to the top against gravity, that's happening against gravity. Isn't that very interesting? It's because of the fact that there are intermolecular forces acting which are responsible for this fluid movement. And uh, science of physics clearly states that it's surface tension, which is a product of cohesive forces within the liquid and the adhesive forces between the liquid and solid to which it is in contact with. These are the factors which are responsible for movement of fluid in this particular action. That is through capillary action, even against gravity for that matter, right? I hope it's clear and well done. If you're wrong, not an issue. If you're right, just, uh, again, it's not an issue. Nothing should ever be an issue or ever be an issue, okay? Yeah. Uh, if you're right, not an issue. If you're wrong, again, you always have an opportunity to update uh, the information existing in your mind and progress accordingly. Fourth question, you have two statements. So again, based on your clinical experience, so what do you think about this statement? Statement A, the car should be washed under direct water after separation from impression material. Is it? Okay. Statement B, before using model trimmer, the cast should be soaked in slurry water. So uh, let me know which statement is true and which statement is false. I mean, all of you might have poured cast, all of you might have washed it, all of you might have used slurry. You know slurry, it's super saturated calcium sulfate solution, which is obtained by dissolving chips in water, or you can use the product which comes out of a model trimmer, slurry. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So uh, cast should be washed under direct water after separation from impression material. You never do that, right? What if you lose all the fine details? Okay, and statement B, uh, before using model trimmer, the car should be soaked in slurry water. Yes, but why? You have to soak it in slurry water, but why? So let me leave that question unanswered. So let's review some literature. So finishing the diagnostic cast, diagnostic cast should be separated from impression only an hour after its initial set. Alginate its elastic, it's easy to remove impression away from cast. Care should be taken while removing the impression material from undercut areas. Small nodules and projections on impression surface should be removed. The cast should not be washed directly under water because the superficial surface of plaster will dissolve and get washed away. So you don't want to do that. Statement A is false. If a base former is not used during the third port, then base of the cast should be trimmed using model trimmer. And before using model trimmer, the cast should be soaked in slurry water for five minutes. The statement B is right. The option D is right answer as most of you have chosen. But why do you want to wash or uh, wash this cast in slurry water before you go for model trimming? What could be the reason? So this is one question which I would like to leave unanswered. We'll discuss the same tomorrow. I want you guys to find out. I'll start 
the next quick revision class with this question. Why the car should be soaked in slurry water before you go for trimming in model trimmer. Okay, so option D is a right answer. Fantastic. To avoid dimensional changes. Okay, let's see. So final question, I mean, a penultimate. Uh, we still have a case based question. So the given picture denotes which class of uh, Brenma classification of bone quality. Yeah. Also, I wanted to update the classification name. It is Lake Home Jab Bone Classification 1985. And then we have Mish classification in 1990, 1993. So uh, which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So according to Lake Home and Zab classification, uh, which class does this particular illustration fall into? So we have options one, two, three, and four. I see most of you. Wonderful. You have selected all the options. A, B, C, D, all options are covered. So one of you must be right, without any doubt. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Yeah, really, one of you must be right. Uh, You've chosen all the options, all options covered. Okay, I know it's very challenging, but let's review this information as you can see. So Lekhom and Zaro bone classification 1985. So bone quantity radiographically has been classified into class A, B, C, D, and E. As you can see in the top part of this illustration, this is bone quantity. Class A to the left side, you can see no resorption, normal ridge pattern. So class A, most of the alveolar bone is present. Class B, moderate residual ridge resorption. Class C, advanced ridge resorption. Class D, moderate resorption of basal bone is present. And class E, extreme variant. So obviously A to E, the variant goes to an extreme level. And in the below, at the bottom of this illustration, you can see bone quality on which we designed this particular equation. So the one that's projected to you is number two here, right? Uh, where do you have number two? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, D1, D2, D3, and D4. So D1, or you can say in this particular classification, class one, because D1, D2, D3, D4, they're introduced by Mish. So the ones which are introduced by Lekhom and Zad, that is class one, two, three, and four. So class one on to the extreme left, you can see homogeneous cortical bone. And number two, that is class two, you can see thick cortical bone with narrow cavity, the one which we asked you in this particular equation. And three, thin cortical bone with dense trabecular bone of good strength. And four, very thin cortical bone with low density trabecular bone of poor strength. In fact, we discussed the same in, as far as I remember in one of the previous study club discussions. So this classification is given by Lake Home and Zard way back in 1985. And Mish has given a classification similar to that of this bone quality, which you are calling it as D1, D2, D3, and D4. D1 is oak wood, D2 pine wood. So this classification is based on clinical perception or hand feel resistance. So D1, you can make a note of oak wood, D2 pine wood, D3 balsa wood, D4 styrofoam. Uh, I should definitely experience the same. So that's according to Mish classification 1990 and 1993. I think I didn't present you that particular table, right? So I hope it's clear. And I hope the answer is obvious in this case. So it denotes class two, right? As evident in the bottom illustration. I think most of you have chosen B. Fantastic. Now, let's move on to our case-based question in quick revision class related to prosthodontics. A patient who wears a complete maxillary denture complains of burning sensation in palatal area of his or her mouth. Okay, let's assume her mouth. This is indicative of too much pressure being exerted by the denture on which of the following? Incisor foramen, palatal mucosa, hamular notch, posterior palatal seal. You need not answer this now. We'll discuss this case based and along with the previous question which I've asked you, like why should you wash cast in a slurry water before you go for a model trimming, right? So we'll discuss both of them in next uh, quick revision class. And I want you guys to find out relevant answer and do some homework and try finding out relevant explanation or reasoning behind the option which you choose, okay? Uh, <laughs> okay.
Right. Fantastic. I really appreciate your enthusiasm. Okay, right, so let's conclude our quick vision class. So I hope the session was useful. And also I've been getting several requests on uh, conducting more sessions, we'll definitely do that. Also we'll have an exclusive session on COVID-19. And also I presented you some information, right? A mouthwash, it's composition, which is based on an in vitro study. You still have to wait and watch. And Zoom dysmorphia, I think that's the reason why our YouTube live sessions are more popular than Zoom live interactions. Maybe because of Zoom dysmorphia, is that one of the minor factors which is actually stopping aspirants from participating in live debate sessions? So that's something which we should analyze based on. We'll definitely do a study on the same. Okay, right. So among the given options or among the given uh, questions or topics, you have any further queries or you need any further clarification, uh, feel free to get back to me 24 by 7. Okay, and that's it. I'll see you again mostly tomorrow in another quick revision class. Just keep this enthusiasm, consistency, and momentum going. So wish you all the best. Love you all. Good night. So please provide some motivation. You just, uh, you just tell me, you just give me one clarification, subscribe. So what kind of motivation do you wish to have? Extrinsic or intrinsic motivation? So extrinsic motivation, no matter how much is induced, it's only temporary. Short lived, uh, the T half is very less, very minimal. But if you're intrinsically motivated, it's everlasting. So whenever you feel demotivated, anyone, just ask yourself some basic fundamental questions, even though they are very tough and challenging. Why are you preparing? What's your driving force? And how would you like to see yourself in the next one year, three years, five years, or 10 years? These questions will give you ample clarity. I mean, if you don't ask yourself these questions, then when there is no clarity, you feel like, what's the point in doing it? Why am I doing this? So when you realize the fact that you're doing this for yourself, for your own progress, and you wish to see yourself in a particular position after one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 or 40 years from now, I visualize myself till my 55 or 60 years. I don't know if I'm going to live that long, but at least, I should have clarity from my side because after all, this is my life. So in your life, you should have that clarity. And if you don't, uh, whose fault is that? So please keep asking yourself these questions and you'll get ample clarity with which you'll get intrinsic motivation. And one powerful tool which I would recommend to each and every one of you is visualize yourself in a position where you want to be. So what I mentioned previously is a prerequisite for this. And then once you have clarity, visualize yourself in a position where you want to be like, Imagine yourself to be the topper in the coming entrance exam. Imagine yourself to be in a position where you wish to be. So how would that make you feel? Excited? Worried? So that will be a very, very powerful. This visualization technique will be a very powerful intrinsic motivational factor, right? And once you realize the fact that anything that you do, if you're giving your best, if you love what you're doing, you really have nothing to worry about. But when we resort to comparisons, when we compare ourselves with others, when we keep worrying about our past experiences or future expectations, then definitely any journey, not just preparation, any journey for that matter is going to be a living hell without any doubt, right? So please keep, ask yourself, uh, keep asking yourself these questions and definitely you'll have the tremendous source of intrinsic motivation and you will no longer rely on other, uh, 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 other motivation without any doubt. Take my word. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate your enthusiasm. Yes, Mukherjee, please conduct sessions on doubt clearing sessions on pharma. Mukherjee, doubt clearing sessions, we always do 24 by seven. You can get back through mail, through our doubt clarification form. It can be any doubt from any subject all your doubts will be clarified 24 by seven. But if someone is looking for ready-made answers, if someone is looking for getting fed with ready-made answers, then this is not the platform at all. You have any doubt, it's only through active participation that it will be clarified. I've been very clear on this right from the beginning of our journey. 
So you can get back through mail at proud to be dentist at gmail.com. It can be any doubt. Use a doubt clarification form format. Even if the exam is tomorrow, use a doubt clarification form format. If you're really interested in getting the doubt clarified and we'll do our best to clarify your doubt within 24 to 48 hours to anyone irrespective of your registration status in our academy, whether you're registered, not registered, doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Agalia says, so please do a video in two days before exam, what to do? Agalia, I'm, I'm going to tell you the answer for that question right now itself. Chill, relax, have adequate sleep and very good food and go to the exam with a lot of bubbling energy and enthusiasm. That's it, two days before exam, Rest and digest. Activate your parasympathetic system. That is rest and digest. On the day of exam also, when you, when you are resting and digesting, when you are in a state of cool, you can uh, do your best. You can give your best. See, if the day of exam is about fighting, you know, if it's about some fist fight, then I would ask you to uh, activate your sympathetic system. But no, activate your parasympathetic system it's going to be a fantastic experience. Two days before the exam, just relax, eat well, sleep well, and I'm sure you'll give your best. All these months and years you have been working, uh, for the past five years you have been in undergraduation, what makes you think that something magical will happen in two days? Nothing magical will happen, but you can maintain the momentum, you can maintain the enthusiasm by just relaxing and making sure that you're not getting negatively affected. You do not do anything extra. In the final days, all you need to do is buffer yourself from the negative stimuli. No worry, no panic just because your friend is studying till last minute doesn't mean that you have to study. Just because they're memorizing certain so-called important points doesn't mean that you have to do the same. You've done your homework and you're going to give your performance on the day of exam. Right? So I've given you the answer now itself. So don't blame me if I don't make a video two days before the exam. So anyways, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll definitely be in touch without any doubt. Yeah. And Isha, Isha, Arjun says, thank you, sir, you're a very good teacher. Thank you, Arjun, you are, I really hope, and I'm sure you're a very good student as well. Thank you, thank you for your love and affection, Arjun. Isha, sir, two subjects in a day, please. Uh, why two subjects? Why can't we do all subjects in a day, Isha? Why not all subjects? Why, why are you restricting yourself to two subjects per day? Yes, yes, Isha, I, I got your point. I'll definitely consider your request. Thank you, Pirjada. Always positive. I think that's the only option we all should choose, uh, Agalia. I mean, it's up to individual's choice, but yeah, it's always our choice which side we wish to be, to stay positive and be optimistic or just get affected and influenced natively by all the circumstances and give up, feel or uh, stay demotivated. The choice is completely ours, 100%. Yeah, I think I've covered all your comments without missing initial comments. I'm not getting initial or beginning comments now. I might have missed them, but anyways. So by the way, what are your scores? I think no one has predicted or published your scores. What are your scores uh, out of 20? I think it's going to be fun and competitive, as I said, right? Out of 20, how much did you score? Now, again, don't say that you're feeling worried or tensed. If you're uh, feeling so, then don't publish your result here. If you want to know, then do publish it. And irrespective of how much you score, I'm telling you before you publish it itself, irrespective of how much you score, there is always scope to improve. There is always chance to improve and progress, right? Yeah, so 15 seems to be the highest score. Yes, Vaishnavi. Yes, Vaishnavi. I'll get back to you through mail. I've seen your mail just now. I'll get back to you uh, through mail as soon as possible. One month for need? Yes, one month for need. Are you excited or are you worried? Exactly, Agalia. You can't uh, feel positive and negative at the same time. So we have that choice. See, when you realize this statement, or when you understand the significance of the statement that we have a choice, it means we have the part, the part to choose. I mean, I can choose for, on my behalf, right? 
I'm not going to choose for you or you're not going to choose for me. So when I can choose for myself, so will I choose smartly or will I be dumb? So again, that's my choice. Yes, yes Arjun, very good. Our can so oh, subscribe got 19, <laughs> 19 out of 20. <laughs> okay, that's, that's okay. I mean, I don't know how that's possible, but Neha, Neha, Neha got 20 out of 20. That's good. Subscribe, really appreciate it, enthusiasm. Okay, so 20 out of 20, fantastic. 12 out of 12, uh, 12 out of 20, fantastic. Yes, Dolly, will it be played back? Yes, of course, you can play this video infinite number of times once the stream ends, okay? Okay, Arjun has secured seven, Sujay 12, Priyanka 12. Okay, wonderful. So, irrespective of how much you score, right? It can be 12, 20, 7, 6, irrespective of how much you score look at this as an opportunity. Let me ask you this question. If at all, there are questions from these topics, which we discuss now in the final exam, are you going to repeat these mistakes or are you going to rectify and progress? So that's something which I want you to understand and proceed accordingly. So in respect of how much you score, you always have chance to improve, to progress. Even on the final, of, uh, final day of exam, even that's a learning opportunity. It's not just about scoring. It's not just about ranking. It's not just about securing MDSC. What for? You have to go uh, do masters. And these are the things which are going to help you enormously in your masters. This is not just for sake of securing marks and ranks. And we are uh, really overwhelmed by this scoring criteria, the exam pattern that we're missing, the fundamental point, right? So, so anyways, let me conclude it here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, guys. Good night. Take care. I'll see you again uh, in the next session. It's another clinical subject. Also, I said, as I mentioned, I've been getting requests on this COVID 19 related discussion. I'll also consider that request. Good night.